I'll be ready. Here, aspicream arthritis. Huh. Full talking into. That's when it's time for me to head back. Took full advantage. Improve the quality of this young woman's life. Our patient is dying because of you. So crosswave. No allies. The gentleman from Virginia. Civilians under attack in Ukraine. Hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Acuna, along with Sean Duffy, Dagan McDowell, and Joey Jones, and welcome to The Big Saturday Show. As hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian citizens are desperately attempting to escape the country, Russia has broken its ceasefire pledge. Civilians in the Ukrainian port city of Mirapol are under continuous attacks and are being forced back by Russian shelling. The city left without power, water, and heat services amid multiple days of of rocket fire and bombings. Also tonight, stunning video shows Ukraine forces shooting down a Russian chopper, the helicopter exploding on impact. Now to Benjamin Hall, live in Kyiv, Ukraine, to give us the latest. Ben. Yeah, hi, Alicia. Look, across this day and throughout uh, the whole country today, we have seen Russian forces continuing to attack civilians, continuing to attack urban centers, and as such, the death toll is also rising. About 15 minutes from where we are now is a small town called Erpil, uh, and there earlier they were shev shelling heavily, thousands of people having to flee, having to cross a bombed-out bridge to get across, trying to get to the relative safety of the capital, Kyiv, where we are now. But how long the capital itself remains safe, nobody knows. And that's because Russian forces are increasing their push towards the city. And it's thought to be just a matter of time till they try to take it. Across the country, they have been besieging other cities as well. Putin's forces continue to bombard civilians. In Mariupol, a ceasefire had been announced to allow civilians to evacuate. But that fell apart almost immediately as Russian forces shelled the safe corridors out. President Zelensky had a call with senators earlier today. He reiterated he needs more weapons. He also tore into what he calls a weak NATO for refusing the no-fly zone, and he spoke about Russia's military losses. The Russian army didn't reach its goals, though it reached almost 10,000 killed Russian servicemen. 10,000 is a horrific figure. They are boys of 18, 20 years old, very young boys, almost children. They are soldiers who had no explanation of what they were sent to fight for. Ukrainians are doing their very best to fight back, and they've had some success. This video shows a Russian helicopter being shot down. It was released by the Ukrainians and posted with the caption, Welcome to Hell. It is giving some people hope, and as a result, we continue to see defiant scenes and hear defiant voices. There is another round of diplomacy that's just been announced by the Belarusians. That'll take place on Monday, but frankly, right now, little hope that there can be a diplomatic solution at this point. Alicia? Ben, I have a question. When the decision came down on the no-fly zone yesterday, there was a professor who told Neil Cavuto, he looked right into the camera and said, Americans, this only delays things. This does not keep you out of getting tangled in the war. Basically saying it was inevitable. What's your sense that as we watch these pictures come in, more and more horrific day after day of children being killed especially, that it will be inevitable that we get dragged in? That's certainly what everyone here says. You ask any Ukrainian, they say, look, we understand your reluctance to get involved. No one wants to have a conflict with Russia, uh, two nuclear powers. But uh, this is coming your way. Putin only understands one thing, and that is military force. And so far, it's been nothing but appeasement. Um, you know, dialogue, diplomacy hasn't worked. And at every point, 
uh, he has kept going. Sanctions haven't worked. And so that's what the argument would be over here, that it needs to be a no-fly zone, or the U.S. needs to give uh, fighter jets, or they need to escalate in some way. They need to give more. But if the, if the biggest threat is sanctions and they send some of these missiles over, inevitably, eventually, the sheer scale and size of the Russian armed forces, 200,000 people, yes, they may suffer some setbacks, logistical supplies, etc., but eventually they will power on through. They will learn from their mistakes, and it's hard to stop them. So you're right. People over here are saying, please give us the no-fly zone, uh, but they understand the reluctance not to. Yeah, Ben. A home, but you guys do what you want. Hi, <laughs> To a Ukrainian official, Russian soldiers fired their weapons to disperse them. In this chilling video, a man in the front of the crowd appears to be shot in the street. Another video shows protesters scattering as a barrage of gunfire rings out. Tonight, Ukraine's foreign minister with a new message for Putin. Putin, leave Ukraine alone. You will not win this war. Arlet Signs, CNN. Arlet, thank you. Let's go live to the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv right now. Our chief international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, is joining us. Clarissa, you've been following the plight of citizens, uh, average Ukrainians, simply trying to escape the damage on the outskirts of the capital. What's the latest? That's right, Wolf. Well, we have heard another fiery speech from Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky this evening in which he praises his citizens for continuing to resist Russian aggression. He calls on them to go on the offensive, go on the streets. We need to fight every time we have an opportunity. And he goes on to commend their faith and the protests that have been ongoing. But listen, Wolf, there's no question that this war is taking a heavy toll on the Ukrainian people. And we saw that firsthand for ourselves when we finally got access to a Kiev suburb called Irpin, where people have been under heavy bombardment for seven days and are only just managing to flee to safety. Take a look. For seven days, the Kiev suburb of Irpin has been pummeled by Russian strikes. And you can see it in the faces of those leaving. Exhaustion, fear, and gratitude to the soldiers helping them flee. This bridge was downed by the Ukrainians to prevent Russian forces from getting into the city center. Now it's yet another hurdle people must cross. There has been a steady barrage of artillery since we got here just over an hour ago, and a never-ending stream of people just desperately trying to cross to safety. Natalia mm -hmm. tells us she was injured just a couple of hours earlier. We tried to get some stuff out of our apartment, she says, and a shell or something hit, and I got hit by shrapnel. Still in shock, she dismisses the pain and walks away unaided. Others need more assistance. Soldiers carry a makeshift stretcher to ferry an elderly woman to safety. <laughs> President Putin has said his army is not targeting civilians. But the exodus from Irpin tells a different story. <laughs> Everyone steps in where they can, including us. What the, what the? An elderly woman calls out for help. <laughs> Clearly confused by the chaotic situation, take one of her bags. So people are obviously incredibly affected by the situation. They're frightened. They're exhausted. They're on edge. They leave behind whatever they cannot carry, with no sense of when they will return. A woman approaches, completely overcome. <laughs> For what, she cries. For what? This is just one suburb in one city that has felt the wrath of Russia's onslaught. Artillery, 
missiles and fighter jets. The planes were flying and I just covered my ears, Olga Kudlai tells us. So she's saying that now she doesn't even know where she's going to go next. She has lived in Irpin for 45 years. It was so beautiful and now it's destroyed, she says. What are they trying to achieve? To bring us to our knees? But against all odds, 10 days into this war, Ukraine is still standing. A woman waits to be evacuated, trembling, but resilient. We will overcome everything, she says. For the people of Irpin, the journey is just beginning. They're loaded onto buses to the train station. From there, they don't know where they will go. Now, Wolf, just to give you an idea of what these people are dealing with, yesterday they had been evacuating them primarily using trains, using the railway. But last night, according to Ukrainian authorities, Russian saboteurs actually attacked the railway, blew it up, meaning those trains can no longer move back and forth. And that's why you're seeing this kind of bottleneck happening at various bridges in this area as people desperately try to flee. Well, so powerful, uh, so awful indeed. Clarissa, I want you to stand by. I want to bring Anderson back in. Uh, Anderson, Clarissa's reporting clearly shows the desperation of these people uh, simply trying to escape. Uh, I know you've spent a lot of time speaking to Ukrainian citizens. Just how strong is their resolve in the face of this uh, enormous crisis? Well, I mean, I think Clarissa's report shows I mean, we've, we've just seen that resolve, uh, a woman who's breaking down crying and yet says we, we will overcome this in, in the end. But the other woman, Clarissa, that he spoke to saying for what, for what? And I think that's a sentiment we hear a lot of, from people here. I mean, for, for, what, for what is all this happening? It's just one man's desire to take over and break the back of, of this country. Lviv uh, has not seen scenes like that, thankfully. It's in the far west of the country. This is where those trains often come to. And at the train station here, which is not far from where I am, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have just poured through and they continue to come every single day, uh, trying to move on to, to points farther west, to Poland, to Romania, to, to other countries. Uh, and there's no sign that that, I mean, if the, if the trains now are targeted, that is obviously going to be a, a tremendous blow to the effort to try to get women and children uh, to some semblance of safety. You're absolutely right. And, and Ukraine, uh, everyone knows, represented absolutely no threat to Russia at all. But now this is day 10 of this brutal Russian assault on the people of Ukraine. Clarissa, Russia has continued to strike these corridors that people are using to flee, as you correctly pointed out, uh, going back on its word for uh, what was supposed to be a temporary ceasefire. So what danger do civilians face as they're simply trying to get to safety? Well, simply put, Wolf, there is no real safe place at the moment. Even for the people I saw, okay, they were leaving Irpin, which was being steadily hit constantly, as you could hear throughout my story there. But where do they go next? Where is safe? The capital, Kiev, where we are, it's still not safe, right? This is just grades or shades of, of real danger. But the fighting is encroaching. Uh, the Ukrainians are defending as best they can. They've had su success in pushing the Russian forces back. But the Russians are slowly but surely uh, beginning the process of fully encircling this city with the ultimate gain, uh, the ultimate aim, rather, of laying siege and potentially engaging in even more severe bombardment. So really, the illusion or the, or, or the idea that you're passing to safety is, is an illusion. It's a, it's a temporary reprieve for a moment. And then the next question becomes, where do you go next? And how can this country, with its infrastructure, keep up and cope with this huge swell of more than a million people forced from their homes. It, it's simply not sustainable, Wolf. Yeah, more than uh, 1.3 million have already fled for their lives uh, to neighboring countries, according to the United Nations. Clarissa, uh, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. Uh, obviously, Anderson is sticking around for the next two hours.
There's more breaking news we're following. Uh, Russia increasingly targeting civilians in Ukraine, including protesters. We're going back live to Kyiv when we come back. How do Sugar Ray Leonard's feet feel when he gets the proper support for his Skechers Archfit footwear? Sugar's feet feel sweet. So you should wear footwear that provides the support we all need. Skechers Archfit. I'm on fire. Hot feet, hot feet. Try Skechers Archfit with expert certified support. CBS Sports college basketball coverage is sponsored. Way he holds off his. They won their first cup since. The no one. You're gonna need. No resort, Doc. For. The that America is the nation that had the most hegemony of power and used it so without acquiring the nations that it protected or imposing its will on the nations that it protected. The least acquisitive superpower in the history of the world. Americans have sacrificed much over the generations to secure our freedoms and others. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Now the tyranny and autocracy of Vladimir Putin tests us again. Though American forces will not be engaged directly in this war, that does not mean that America is sitting on the sidelines. Far from it. And we must be engaged. This resolution speaks to engagement. President Biden has unified not only NATO, but a broad coalition of the world's democratic nations and those committed to the post-war order of respecting peace, borders, and yes, diplomacy. Dozens of nations have partnered to stand up to Putin and to support the freedom fighters in Ukraine. Together, we have imposed punishing sanctions that are already hurting Putin's regime. We are already seeing thousands of Russians taken to the streets in their country to demand that Putin end this unjust war, this unprovoked war, this criminal war, and stop the unnecessary death and destruction on both sides for which Vladimir Putin alone bears responsibility. Today, this House, the People's House, representing the greatest democracy in history, the leading democratic nation in the world, is expressing our support for the Ukrainian people in their struggle for freedom and self-government. I hope and I urge that this resolution pass with not a single negative vote. Let there be no mistake throughout the globe that, yes, we have differences between Republicans and Democrats, but we in this House are all Americans committed to freedom, committed to democracy, to committed to the peaceful relations between nations. It recognizes the egregious and inhumane actions undertaken by the Russian military as Putin's command, at Putin's, Putin's command, including the shelling of civilian targets and the killing of innocents in order to instill fear and weaken Ukrainian resolve. We know that resolve, however, Mr. Speaker, will not be broken. We've seen it in the eyes of the President, and we've seen it in the eyes of the citizens in those Freedom Squares. This resolution further recognizes, importantly, that Russian aggression against Ukraine did not begin last week. It began as soon as the Ukrainian people rejected a Putin-backed autocrat, established a true democracy, and sought the security and protection of stronger bonds with its fellow democracies in Europe and NATO, which, of course, it had every right as a sovereign nation to do. Putin sent his forces to occupy Crimea. Mr. Speaker, in my view, we were not as determined that that should not happen at that time. 
We must not repeat that mistake. He instigated violent separatist uprising in Donbas region that has festered for eight long years. His unprovoked and unjustifiable invasion of Ukraine comes after it became increasingly clear that the separatists could not achieve Putin's expansion arm, expansionist aims on their own. He tried to do it surreptitiously through agents. It did not succeed, so he took the next step, a tragic, criminal step. This resolution also makes clear that the United States will continue to support Ukraine by providing both military and humanitarian assistance while maintaining painful sanctions. We've come from several days of meetings with uh, NATO, the European Union, uh, countries beyond the G7, uh, and we see that support not only uh, continue security support, humanitarian support, economic support, but uh, that support will increase. And as to the pressure on Russia, not only is it unprecedented, not only is it producing uh, very, very concrete results in Russia, but that uh, pressure, too, will not, will not only continue, it will grow until this war, this war of choice is brought to an end. Welcome back to Politics Nation. Let's continue our conversation on the Ukraine crisis with my political panel. Joining me now is Michelle Goldberg, columnist for The New York Times, and also David Jolly, former congressman from Florida, both are MSNBC political analysts. Uh, Michelle, let's start with the meeting between Ukrainian President Zelensky and the Senate this morning. This comes as the House is expected to debate a $10 billion aid package to Ukraine in the coming days. Meanwhile, many Americans are warming up uh, to the leader since Russia invaded Ukraine. According to the latest Economist YouGov poll, 44 percent are in favor and 16 percent view him unfavorably. How does Zelensky's popularity help Ukraine? Also, uh, could continued aid to the Ukraine, one of these rare issues where there's broad bipartisan agreement on the Hill, can it be impacted by this? Well, look, I don't think you can overstate the role that Zelensky's personal heroism and sort of everyman charisma has had in rallying the world to his side. You know, a week, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I think there was a consensus that there would be sanctions on Russia if it invaded, but that they wouldn't be crushing. Nobody was talking about kicking Russia um, out of the SWIFT system. You know, you certainly didn't have major brands pulling out of Russia. And so I think, you know, what Zelensky has done, if you haven't seen the foot, you know, people out there haven't seen the footage of the crowds last night in Prague and Georgia and Germany um, out to rally for Zelensky and a huge or to back to rally for Ukraine and you know a huge monitor with him speaking to the crowd. You know people have been so hungry for both for heroism and for somebody really standing up for democracy after years when it has seemed you know people have been so cynical about it. It's been decayed and embattled and to see what. Zelensky and the people around him are willing to risk in its defense, I think, has reminded people of what they believe in. And it's tempting to be cynical about some of these Republicans who defended Donald Trump when he blackmailed Zelensky, when he tried to hold up aid to Ukraine. But frankly, I'm just glad that most of them are now on the right side, that, they're, that the pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party is being marginalized and that there really is a political consensus for helping Ukraine. David, there might be some agreement between the parties regarding Russia, but inside the Republican Party, there's a rift developing. Former Vice President indirectly called out his former boss, Donald Trump, on Friday at an RNC event when he said there's no room in the GOP for apologists for Putin. What do you make of Pence's comments now, especially given he said nothing while Trump was cozying up to Putin yeah. during uh, his term? And do you think Republican figures such as Trump or Tucker Carlson, who sound sympathetic to Putin, are a fringe element or do they have real influence? 
Yeah, I don't know that they're a fringe element. They might be in the minority, but they are voices that set the framing and narrative for many people across the country, right? Those who follow conservative media listen to Tucker Carlson more than they do Mitch McConnell or Mike Pence. And I think these voices that are giving aid and comfort to Putin are either doing it out of pure ignorance, which truly there is a large swath of ignorance within today's Republican Party, devoid of any grounding in foreign policy or understanding of, of politics at all, po political policy. Or it's malice, or it's just values antithetical to the West. And I think that third is the most dangerous. So when Mike Pence steps on the uh, onto the field and says, look, this is wrong. There should be no aid and comfort to Putin within the GOP or within the country. That voice is welcome. Uh, but as you pointed out, it's a little too late. Uh, history will record that Mike Pence protected and enabled and empowered Donald Trump while Donald Trump was committing acts that led to his impeachment, including specifically around Ukraine. So good for Mike Pence, but it does little to change his legacy. Now, Michelle, switching gears now to the push to ban Russian oil. Democrats in Congress want to do it, but the Biden administration is concerned it may affect energy prices. Inflation has been a major topic leading up to the midterms, and problems for President Biden in the midterms could be a result. What should be done in your judgment? Well, look, of course they think that they should do it. Um, you know, the U.S. doesn't actually import that much oil from Russia, so whether it's going to make a big impact, I think, remains to be seen. It would really depend on whether other countries join the United States. But I think that, you know, I think Biden should do it. I think that you can be honest with the American people, level with the American people, say that you're going to have to. I think, the, I think you can get support for people agreeing to pay a little bit more for gas in exchange for standing up to Vladimir Putin. And actually, you can sort of, um, you know, there, there's a huge amount of concern about inflation, obviously. But I think that if people believe that they're making sacrifices for a higher cause, it will be a little bit easier to take. Um, and the fact that there's bipartisan cover for it also makes it a little bit easier. You know, I don't, the Republicans will still turn around and blame Joe Biden for high gas prices. I think that's a given. But at this point, I think that, you know, the, the price of energy, the price at the pump, I think, is of a lesser concern than the future of Ukraine. On the outside, hitting the side of one of these reactor uh, tubes isn't going to blow it up or, or cause, you know, Chernobyl. They're not built that way. Most of what's sensitive is underground and under concrete. But what is a threat and what is a safety threat? We need to separate fact from <laughs> fiction, and Zelensky didn't help us out with his comments on this, and I don't know if that was on purpose or not. But there are what we call cooling ponds and dry storage on the same facility of nuclear material that's been used as much as it can for power, but is still radioactive. And right. if a pump house got destroyed and those ponds drained, or if one of the dry, dry containment uh, got cracked open, then you would have spillage radiation. Nothing like what happened at Chernobyl, but it would be an, an unsafe environment at that point. The most dangerous thing that happened was that the workers at the power plant were not, being, were not communicating with the Russians that took it over to begin with. And then you have a problem there to where if you need a certain type of engineer because of a problem that happens in everyday life of operating these and you can't get a hold of them because you're basically held hostage, that's the type of safety concern there was here. When we say weaponizing a nuclear power plant, what we mean is he's going to use the power that plant produces and hold it hostage. He can cut it off, cut it down. Um, the biggest concern is simply their ability to operate the plant regularly and that's what they need to be able to do the latest report is that that they're starting to have shift changes and that they're they're starting to allow them to operate this plan as they should uh, there was a statement Alicia that was put out by the um, International Atomic Energy Agency not that long ago and the director general of the IAEA uh, makes some statements he said that it is a tense situation between the Russian forces controlling this nuclear power site and the Ukrainian personnel operating that it must not last too long. So actually rather late to the operation. He brought with him a hollow glass. It's provide us the support we need to protect our country and freedom. Slava Ukraina. Glory to Ukraine and its people. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you, Congresswoman Sparks. 
for working with me so that we can make a bipartisan message right here on the people's floor. And I yield back to back my time. An update now on the situation with Ukraine. U.S. Senators and Representatives took part in a video call with President Zelensky today. Some reporting on that. Fox News correspondent Chad Pergram writes that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said to President Zelensky, we are inspired by you and the strength and courage of the Ukrainian people. Senator McConnell and I are working very hard in a bipartisan fashion to get all the assistance the administration has requested for the Ukrainian people. Together, we will get over $10 billion in economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to the Ukrainian people quickly. Meanwhile, Oklahoma Republican Senator James Langford tweeted, Ukraine is fighting tenaciously against a Russian invasion. If the world does not stand with Ukraine now, Russians will keep moving across Europe until they are stopped. If the Russians are foolish enough to attack a nuclear power plant, they are foolish enough to do anything. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every day we're taking your calls live, on the air, on the news of the day. And we'll discuss policy issues that impact you. Fuel your day with the generation of driver. To break it. Sorry, I'll never do that again. I'm never gonna go back to the monitor. Quarter or that you know, kind of a, a late portion of the first quarter, I think USD has really been in control of this game in the WCC. And we are excited to welcome you to Las Vegas. This he wants to heat in a, in, very, in a very cold winter. That's, that's his game plan here. And I don't think he cares, you know, what kind of wrecking ball he takes, what kind of threats he makes to the world. Again, with this attacks on the nuclear power plant, um, it is, it's, it's, it's kind of deranged in how he's behaving. Coming up, Ukrainians are fleeing the war zone. We take you there live to Lviv, where refugees are trying to go. Next. strength reduces inflammation on Ukraine is the largest mass migration of people on the European continent since World War II officials say and we're seeing waves of people flooding into to neighboring Poland that's the the biggest uh, destination spot for many but there's also Romania and Moldova CNN senior national correspondent Sarah Seidner is there on the border in Poland uh, near the border sir so you're at a shelter for refugees walk us through what you have been seeing today because you've been there all week and and the people keep coming they do and you know what i noticed today uh different from the beginning of the week is that there are more people more mothers more children many more we noticed the buses uh, are coming more frequently there's a lot more people um and then there are a lot more volunteers um to to try and help they are bringing all manner of things this is the first time we've seen this huge box of toys and we've been watching children come one by one to pick up the toys um, these two were just digging through there trying to find something that they liked because as you might imagine when people leave their houses they simply can only carry basically one bag that's what we've been seeing just very very few pieces of luggage each person has something small sometimes just a paper bag um, something else that we've noticed, you know, it is really cold, and I know um, you've been seeing you just frigid temperatures here. These kids are so tired, so, so sleepy, that their parents lied them down on a hard wooden bench and tried to cover them the best they could, putting over that, you see that metallic, you see that metallic uh, material. You often see that when uh, firefighters show up and it's freezing, and you can see the little girl's hand just trying to pull it around her because it is so cold, but they're so tired, they're able to fall asleep sitting and slumped over there uh, here as adults mill about trying to figure out where they're going to go. Um, one after the other, and I want to give you a look at the buses, Anderson, because these are not, you know, just small vans. These are huge buses that would often might be used for tourism, and now they're filled with brand new refugees. You said something that I thought really struck a chord, that all of the people that you are seeing here uh, that do not have those signs, the people that they are trying to help folks, but all of the people that you are seeing here waiting on buses, they had homes. 
and jobs and they had school and they had lives and they had a place to be and a country to be in and more than seven days later all of a sudden they have very little or nothing we have seen people coming over the border with just the clothes on their back and again we're talking about uh, more than 500,000 people have come to Poland alone because they're taking the brunt uh, of the Ukraine war uh, war refugees and so this has been a really really disturbing but also touching scene here with all the volunteers trying to help Anderson yeah, and every person you see at that border has left one or two or many more people behind in their family, their husbands, their partners, their boyfriends, uh, fathers, whatever it may be, who are fighting or who simply just can't make the difficult journey. It's, uh, it, it is a personal tragedy as well as, uh, as a tragedy for, for Ukraine writ large. Sarah Seidner, thanks for being there. Wolf, back to you. All right, thank you, Anderson. Thanks to Sarah as well. Let's get some more on the breaking news right now. Joining us, Poland's ambassador to the United States, Mark, uh, Mark Magarowski. Uh, uh, ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how dire is the refugee crisis on the ground right now? Thank you very right much now? for the invitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, is Poland prepared uh, to start receiving over the next few weeks, even months, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, of Ukrainian refugees crossing the border into Poland because the numbers are enormous. First of all, I would like to correct one figure. It's already about 800,000 refugees who have crossed the Polish border since the beginning of the hostilities a few days ago. And I have to tell you frankly that this is probably the first such migration crisis in Europe's history in which the host country does not even need to build refugee camps because all those 800, nearly 800,000 refugees have already found or will find safe shelter in Polish homes, in Polish uh, boarding houses, uh, student dormitories. This eruption of uh, uh, solidarity, sincere sympathy towards the Ukrainian people is really something uh, extraordinary. It is a commendable joint effort of the state authorities, of uh, thousands of uh, volunteers, ordinary citizens, municipalities, and again, I have to confess, also for the first time in my life, I am so proud of two nations at the same time, mine and the Ukrainian. And Poland deserves an enormous amount of credit. You're right, 800,000 Ukrainian refugees coming to Poland, 1.3 million overall going to Poland and the other neighboring countries, and thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands more in the next few days uh, will be fleeing what is going on in Ukraine right now. As you know, Ambassador, NATO has been deploying reinforcements, uh, military uh, troops uh, to Poland over the last several weeks. Thousands of U.S. forces have now been sent to Poland, a NATO ally. Is that enough, do you believe, to deter Putin? Uh, or do you worry that the conflict, God forbid, could spill over into Poland? I don't think this conflict will spill over into Poland or into other countries which are NATO members, because what Putin fears is a military confrontation with NATO. On the other hand, of course, um, we have to be, be very clear about that. The Ukrainians are now fighting not only for their freedom and their independence, but also for ours. And therefore, we have to employ all means at our disposal to repel that aggression, to deter Russia. Uh, however, uh, also uh, taking into account the fact that we should not engage in a military confrontation between NATO and the Russian Federation. The Israeli Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, uh, flew to Moscow today to meet uh, with Putin. They met for a few hours. Uh, uh, you and I met uh, a few days ago here in Washington, and you told me you served as Polish, Poland's ambassador to Israel until a few weeks ago. You spent the last few years in Israel. What role do you think the Israelis potentially could play in trying to mediate some sort of ceasefire? Uh, I believe all diplomatic efforts, especially at this stage of this uh, confrontation, are valuable. And uh, I believe that Israel is one of the few countries in, uh, uh, in the world which tries to maintain uh, good relations both with Russia and with Ukraine. Of course, it's pretty risky to negotiate with Mr. Putin right now, but I believe that we have to uh, leave open all uh, possible um, uh, avenues to explore. And I know the U.S. supports that position and the Ukrainian President Zelensky supports that position as well. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll continue this conversation down the road. Marek, uh, My pleasure. Thank uh, you very much. Magarowski is the uh, Polish ambassador to the United States. And an important note to our viewers, 
For more information about how you can help these humanitarian efforts in Ukraine, go to CNN.com slash impact and help impact your world. The breaking news continues next. Uh, with the latest on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and a closer look at why Vladimir Putin's forces so far have not been able to take the capital. By Friday. Now let's head over to the tower camp for a... Hey, <laughs> folks, we seem to have a visit. It looks like... Looks like you paid too much for your glasses. Oh. Anyone who isn't shopping at America's Best, where two pairs and a free exam start at just $69.95. It's a quality exam worth 50 Standing on the sprinkler head. A cave right on. We've talked about it in the filmmaking. It's the body. Despite the darkness. Ukraine. And the rule of law being applied to Putin's war crimes, maybe they won't go into Taiwan. The only thing I can say when it comes to Putin, it needs to be personal. He could care less, in my view, about his own people, and certainly he could care less about the Ukrainian people. Putin is not a patriot for Russia. If you're a patriot, you wouldn't put your people in this spot of being complicit with war crimes. If you're a patriot, you wouldn't steal your own nation blind. So I'm hoping in the coming days that we can get Republican and Democratic support for a resolution where the United States Congress lends its voice to the Ukrainian complaint in the International Criminal Court. This is a proper exercise of jurisdiction. This is what the court was created for because there is no venue absent this court, in my view, to hold Putin and those who follow his orders accountable. I think our voice will matter. 99 plus, Cole's rewards members say what is that like for the Ukrainian people? Well, here in the West, it's not that bad. The people can get food. Uh, you have a disruption of life out here in the western part of the country. But when you're talking about cities like Kharkiv, when you're talking about Mariupol, they don't have water, they don't have heat, they don't have electricity. Uh, the civilian casualties are very severe. Uh, a lot of civilian structures have been hit. Frankly, we can't even give you totals of how many civilians have been uh, injured or killed because there's too much chaos. But they do not have the basic necessities of life. Access to medicine would be a luxury that these people People just don't have right now as they are constantly under fire and constantly under fire partially and partially because the Russians don't have control of these towns there's nothing uh, close to settled the combat is not letting up uh, and certainly won't until there's some kind of resolution there Mike thanks for the update stay safe out there and uh, and we'll come back to you yeah. tomorrow Next, while attacks in Ukraine intensify gas prices here at home jump 10 cents in one night Prices at the pump continue to rise as the Biden administration is still refusing to ban the import of Russian oil. So what is the plan? More when the Big Saturday Show returns. It's time to start your own business, to turn your dream into something official. LegalZoom has helped launch and support millions of small businesses main points of assault from Russia, all with the intent of taking major population centers. And the response from Washington and NATO. Clarity you need. Tanks are rolling in across the border now. Stay with MSNBC. The face of Ukrainian refugee crisis was in the news this week. As videos and reports surfaced of black people, many of them African students, attempting to flee the Russian invasion of Ukraine and being met with discrimination and refusal at border crossings, deprioritized in favor of white Ukrainians. A reminder that even in the worst of global human crisis, race can and all too often does come up. Joining me now is Charles Blow, New York Times columnist and host of Prime with Charles Blow. Uh, Charles, is it fair to say, plain and simple, that this Ukraine refugees crisis should be a reminder that all refugees are black and brown, are not black and brown, uh, that anyone can be a refugee, and they all should be
be treated equally and fairly because we spent a lot of time this week, some of us in the civil rights community, talking to the U.S. State Department and the U.N. about intervening on these reports. Absolutely, Reverend, um, and thank you for having me. Uh, I mean, what it shows us is that in times of severe stress, when you don't have the opportunity for reflection, when your first thought is your only thought, that racial tribalism comes rushing to the forefront, and that becomes the motivating actor. As you just described, it is, you know, bombs, everyone there is in danger. Bombs and bullets not have brains. They do not know if you're Ukrainian or if you're African, and they don't care, right? And so everyone there is in the same level of danger, and yet the instinct of some people, it appears from both the video we've seen and from the reports of the people who said that they were discriminated against, that that racial tribalism was the trump card and was the activating motivator for the people who were, who were directing people onto those trains. And I should say that I, I've talked with some senior members of the State Department here who are looking into it uh, because this is extremely troubling, the videos and, and uh, the reports we're getting, and we're going to stay on it. But, Charles, do you get the sense that we will see anti-Russian sentiment here in the U.S. that could potentially become violent? On the other side of this, can we see in this country some anti-Russian sentiment? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, one of the, the very the heartening things about uh, this crisis, and particularly young Russians, both in Russia, thousands of them have been uh, uh, arrested because they were demonstrating and saying, not in my name, you will not commit this sort of uh, atrocity, war crime in my name. And also we've seen the same thing from a Russian expat in other countries saying, this is not what I want to be associated with. I think that that is very heartening, actually. I don't think that it, it is a tit for tat uh, in that way. I do think it will be difficult, however, to try to, to, to get some justice for these black people who, were, who say that they were mistreated because, uh, the, the, you know, Ukraine is a cesspool of corruption, including the judiciary, and there is no uh, way of knowing whether or not even after this, if it will be Ukraine or if it will be Russia, no way of knowing if the, the prosecutors would be willing to bring any kind of right. case in this way. No way of knowing if these Africans would even want to go back into this environment to pursue those sorts of cases. So it's just, it's a very difficult situation on all fronts. Now, we're out of time, but I must ask you, do you think this crisis in Ukraine is in any way bringing Americans closer together uh, or further apart. I, I mean, we saw what's happening with some bipartisan efforts in terms of the Congress and the meeting with Zelensky today. Is there any sense that uh, uh, you and I deal with the divisions in this country all the time in our work? Is there any sense that this might be one issue that there's more coming together of American citizens in terms of dealing with this crisis? Well, I think what happens is when you show people, any group of people, including Americans, human suffering, the natural humane response to that is to have compassion and empathy. The problem I think that some people are having is that we don't show the same human suffering of other people who are not white in the same way. And so I think people are drawing a, a distinction and, and, and saying, Let's just compare these two things or these several things and how we respond differently, how, how even neighboring countries around Ukraine respond differently to Ukrainian refugees as opposed to Af Af refugees who are not white and who are not European, and, and drawing out that difference. I think, yes, we are united in the sense that we, you know, uh, human beings who are suffering deserve sympathy. But we're not united because in the sense that all human beings, yeah. who are suffering deserve the same sympathy. Are we doing the same for everyone, even in moments of unity? Charles Blow, thank you for being with us tonight. Up next, my final thoughts. Right now, the big switch is happening across the country. Small. Getting your max.
free fun to rain down into your pockets. Incoming! McCain, don't make another mistake, McCain. Don't. or see their statehood destroyed. Tonight, Ukraine's president is urging his people to keep resisting as new video emerges of a Russian helicopter being shot down and of protesters defying Kremlin forces even as bullets fly. CNN is at key locations across the war zone and indeed around the world as we cover this breaking story. We want to welcome our viewers here in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer, and this is a special edition of The Situation Room. Is that okay? For that once in a life... Casey's pieces for just nine... 467... It's Daniel O'Donnell and special guests. ...will not give their country away to an enemy. My colleague and friend Anderson Cooper is in Ukraine for us. He's joining us once again. He'll be with us throughout this hour. Anderson, uh, as President Zelensky is trying to rally his people, tell our viewers what is happening on the ground tonight. Well, uh, obviously, Wolf, there is growing concern and fear, desperation and widening destruction in and around key cities across Ukraine as civilians are increasingly under fire. CNN's Clarissa Ward is standing by with the latest on the dire situation outside of Kyiv. But first, Arlette Signs has a wrap of the breaking news on this war. Tonight, new images emerging from the battlefront. Ukrainian armed forces releasing this video of the moment they say they shot down a Russian helicopter. The fire engulfed aircraft hurtling towards the ground. Here, another Russian aircraft, a fighter jet, falls from the sky. The Ukrainian military says it took down the plane. Smoke billowing in its wake as it crashed into a residential neighborhood about 90 miles from Kyiv. The Ukrainian Emergency Services says these are the remains of the jet. Bombs undetonated mere steps from homes. The scenes of war. A war Ukrainians continue to fight with limited help from Western allies. In a Zoom call with U.S. lawmakers, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling for greater military assistance, including the transfer of fighter jets from Eastern European countries and the establishment of a no-fly zone. The U.S. and NATO still resisting such a move, warning it could prompt a full-scale war in Europe. A no-fly zone is a, is some, might be a, just a bridge too far that I'm not willing to take that type of risk right now. A U.S. plane shooting down another Russian plane or vice versa is something that could really escalate to, to, to a nuclear war. Russian President Vladimir Putin declaring that any country or organization implementing a no-fly zone would be participants in the conflict. And as Ukraine pushes for more sanctions, Putin stating the sanctions already imposed on his country are equivalent to a declaration of war against Russia. On the ground in Ukraine, a show of solidarity from the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken side by side with the Ukrainian foreign minister on the Polish border. And as to the pressure on Russia, not only is it unprecedented, not only is it producing uh, very, very concrete results in Russia, but that uh, pressure, too, will not, will not only continue, it will grow until this war, this war of choice is brought to an end. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bet today also speaking by phone with Zelensky after a face-to-face -face meeting with Putin in Moscow. Meanwhile, one senior Western intelligence warns that Russia now seems prepared to bombard cities into submission, with the U.S. officials saying Russia is poised to deploy 1,000 more mercenaries in the near future. But with the war in its 10th day, stories of Ukrainian bravery in the face of Russian aggression continue to spread. Watch as a man jumps on top of a Russian armored vehicle, waving a Ukrainian flag. And sounds of gunfire in a small town in northeastern Ukraine, as unarmed protesters stood their ground. In this chilling video, a man in the front of the crowd appears to be shot in the street. 
Another video shows protesters scattering as a barrage of gunfire rings out. Tonight, Ukraine foreign minister with a new message for Putin. Putin, leave Ukraine alone. You will not win this war. Arlette Signs, CNN. Arlette, thank you. Let's go live right now to the Ukrainian capital. Our chief international correspondent, Clarissa Ward, is doing amazing reporting for us. Clarissa, the Russian bombardment right on the outskirts of Kyiv, where you are, has made it very difficult for Ukrainians to actually escape. Uh, and you've seen that firsthand. That's right, Wolf. Well, firstly, President Volodymyr Zelensky has issued another plea uh, to the Ukrainian people tonight, thanking them for their incredible courage and begging them essentially to keep up the resistance. He said, go on the offensive, go on the streets. We need to fight every time we have an opportunity. He thanked them for their faith and for the protests that you've seen across the country. But make no mistake, Wolf, this war is having a huge impact on Ukrainian civilians, as we saw for ourselves when we visited an area that has basically been cut off under heavy bombardment for seven days. For seven days, the Kyiv suburb of Irpin has been pummeled by Russian strikes. And you can see it in the faces of those leaving. Exhaustion, fear, and gratitude to the soldiers helping them flee. This bridge was downed by the Ukrainians to prevent Russian forces from getting into the city center. Now it's yet another hurdle people must cross. There has been a steady barrage of artillery since we got here just over an hour ago, and a never-ending stream of people just desperately trying to cross to safety. Mm -hmm. Natalia. Natalia. Natalia tells us she was injured just a couple of hours earlier. We tried to get some stuff out of our apartment, she says, and a shell or something hit, and I got hit by shrapnel. Still in shock, she dismisses the pain and walks away unaided. Others need more assistance. Soldiers carry a makeshift stretcher to ferry an elderly woman to safety. President Putin has said his army is not targeting civilians. But the exodus from Irpin tells a different story. Everyone steps in where they can, including us. An elderly woman calls out for help. Clearly confused by the chaotic situation, take one of her bags. So people are obviously incredibly affected by the situation. They're frightened. They're exhausted. They're on edge. They leave behind whatever they cannot carry, with no sense of when they will return. A woman approaches, completely overcome. <laughs> For what, she cries. For what? This is just one suburb in one city that has the wrath of Russia's onslaught. Artillery, missiles, and fighter jets. The planes and I just covered my ears, Olga Kudlai tells us. She's saying that now she doesn't even know where she's going to go next. She has lived in Irpin for 45 years. It was so beautiful, and now it's destroyed, she says. What are they trying to achieve? To bring us to our knees? But against all odds, 10 days into this war, Ukraine is still standing. A woman waits to be evacuated, trembling but resilient. We will overcome everything, she says. For the people of Irpin, the journey is just beginning. They're loaded onto buses to the train station. From there, they don't know where they will go. And now, Wolf, up until yesterday, most of these people were being evacuated using trains. 
the railways, this is the most effective and easiest method to move people in and out. But Ukrainian authorities told us that Russian saboteurs actually blew up one of the railway tracks, making it impossible for them to any longer use trains to ferry people out to safety. And that's why you're seeing this bottleneck at this bridge and others like it as people flee on foot desperately trying to protect their families and find something resembling safety, Wolf. Yeah, what Putin's uh, troops are doing is sick, uh, so sick indeed. Clarissa, stand by. I want Anderson uh, to come back into this conversation. Anderson, you've been on the ground now in Ukraine for about a week, uh, bearing witness to Ukrainian resolve, which is so impressive. What has stood out to you most of all among the things that you've heard and seen? Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's become almost a cliche to talk about the resolve, but it, you can't not talk about it. I've never been in a country uh, at war that is so united by among its civilian population in support of, of resistance and in, in the desire to, to do something, to band together, to small acts, large acts, whatever people can do, they're trying to do. And I think it's... It's just extraordinary to see. I've been in a number of countries at war over the last 25 years, and I've just never seen anything like the sense of determination, not just for th last week and this week, but the sense that even if this goes on a long time and even if Russia occupies this country, there's that sense that there will still be resistance e even then. I'm, I... ...aided with hearing loss. Worse, this smiley... The train station there. Thanks, Alex. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky demanding more help from the United States during his call with members of Congress earlier today. We'll speak to Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis of New York, who was on that call next. going on right now in the White House, and they're weighing the, the pros and cons. The pro, obviously, is you increase the pressure that much more on Russia. So far, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are of a financial variety, an economic variety, uh, you know, airspace variety, that kind of thing. But they haven't gone after Russia's main source of income, which, of course, is his energy. Now, some of the financial uh, uh, sanctions have, you know, indirectly affected that, but they have not shut down Russian exports of oil and gas. We don't get that much here, so it's more of a symbolic thing if we were to say we're not taking any Russian uh, energy anymore, but it would, you know, create more price, uh, uh, you know, price increases at the pump very likely. It's going to, it would imp in impact the world market as a whole. And so I think that the, the administration is trying to figure out, what, you know, how far it wants to go and wh whether it can take this risk. You know, they look at the Republicans who are urging them to do this as kind of a, uh, a, a political uh, trap in some ways. The, the Republicans on the one hand saying, hey, you should cut off Russian oil. On the other hand, they're saying, hey, gas prices are going up and it's your fault. So if they do cut off Russian oil, there's a chance that gas prices continue to go up even further, which of course is politically damaging for the Biden administration here at home. Peter Baker, General Kimmett, thank you both so much for getting us started. Next, the cost of war. More than a million people have fled Ukraine. That is in just 10 days. And that number is growing, how Ukraine's neighbors are meeting the mass exodus. And later, more on reports a WNBA player has been detained in Russia and an update on her situation. Also this hour, the threat of nuclear war for the first time in decades. How real is that danger? And a major blow to Russia's disinformation machine. Is this the start of a worldwide crackdown? We are just getting started. Stay with us. The as far as the U.S. and most of the NATO countries are concerned. But, but look, the officials know that w without controlling the skies or at least having the, the stopping the Russians from being able to, to, to you know, get air superiority, um, it is going to be increasingly difficult to stop the, the bombardment of cities, the bombardment of residential communities, and the destruction of the country, you know, missile by missile, bomb by bomb, artillery shell by shell. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Anderson, stand by. Clarissa, as I say to you every single day, stay safe over there. Uh, you're in the U Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. Just ahead, a very, very disturbing a new video of Ukrainian protesters defying Russian forces as the enemy uh, troops simply open fire. Stay with us.
We'll be right back. We're about to offer you this free book that unlocks the five little going very slowly, um, although they are beginning to pick up. Uh, Kharkiv is now making a pounding and, and I call it now depopulation uh, efforts uh, and the direct attack and indiscriminate attack on uh, civilians goes on there. Unfortunately, in Mariupol in the south, we see the same thing. Mariupol now cut off, fairly uh, encircled as the land bridge to Crimea continues and now Mariupol is going through the depopulation effort of parents for myself but you still sell investments that generate high commissions for you right our summit league championships page on kellowland.com is your one stop for complete coverage brackets vlogs photos post-game coverage, and tourney talk. And all the highlights every night on Kellyanne TV. From tip-off to the final buzzer, we've got the Summit League Championships covered. Sponsored by Fox Print Printing and Grab. Kelloland means digital first. And digital... Animals from harm. It's time. Matt. What's... Feel... As you face Russian bombs, rockets, and troops, how I think it's the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian armed forces who actually responded uh, with great courage to um, this brutal attack that was waged against Ukraine by the, by the madman uh, Putin and is being that is being carried out by the Russian troops in this particular moment. Um, we talked about, of course, about sanctioning oil and gas, which is a controversial issue here in the United States. I believe that we do need to stop these imports, ramp up our domestic energy production as well. Um, and then lastly, he talked about the need for more weapons, for more equipments, uh, specifically stingers, uh, drones, jets. Uh, and he made clear that if uh, the United States and NATO were not going to uh, close the skies, then they would like to see the jets. And I think that uh, those Eastern European countries in the EU are in a position uh, to provide those jets. Uh, those are Soviet-style jets that Ukrainians are familiar with flying. Uh, and then perhaps the United States could backfill uh, those countries. But I think there was a lot. It was a productive conversation. We're already seeing things happen as a result. Uh, and I, I just applaud him for his bravery and his dedication to his country. Yeah, he has um, won really the admiration of the world for his resolve and his calm in the face of this terrible Russian onslaught. His forces are outgunned, and yet they are holding their own. Just tell us about uh, his mood. I mean, how did he strike you? He, he uh, obviously, you know, as someone who did, hasn't slept for days, he seemed rather energetic. Uh, he seemed uh, very passionate, very convincing. Uh, somebody who, who made it clear that he's not just fighting for Ukraine, he's fighting for Europe, he's fighting for the Western world. He made it clear that he's concerned also, as we all are, about Russia taking over nuclear power plants. Uh, he also gave us an understanding of how uh, the Russians are intruding into these areas, how they are shelling first, they are creating fear among the people, they are ruin ruining the infrastructure, destroying the infrastructure so people can't leave, and then they're bombarding them. Uh, and then they're trying to get the uh, local governments uh, to surrender, and that's been their tactic. Uh, he also made uh, some. He also gave us some very sad news uh, that thousands of civilians have been killed. They believe more civilians than military, uh, but that uh, among those are children, dozens of children that they have attacked kindergarten schools, a special a need school, uh, and and that was incredibly uh, sad for us all to hear. And I don't know if you guys had the footage I know earlier about an 18-month-old that was killed in the shelling as well. It's just incredibly. Tragic to see what these people are going through, and we need to do what we can uh, to help them and keep high of of weapons and equipments uh, in stock. Vladimir Putin hasn't threatened nuclear uh, war outright, but he always kind of hints that the nuclear button is a possibility. As a member of Congress, uh, is that bluster? Should we? How should we respond to those threats? 
Well, I think that uh, we need to show strength, and I think that our president needs to uh, show more strength. Uh, what has come out of this is that NATO and the United States have shown that we are standing strong together, and I don't think that Vladimir Putin uh, anticipated that. Uh, and that is all the more reason why we need to stop him now. Uh, obviously, there are concerns that if he is successful in Ukraine, this can spill into uh, NATO countries or other bordering countries. Uh, so it is incredibly important that we do what we can uh, to, to supply uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainians uh, with the equipment and with the support uh, that they need. I've also uh, urged our UN ambassador to work to remove Russia from the UN Human Rights Council, from the UN Security Council. We need to continue to make them an international uh, pariah. Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis of New York. Congresswoman, thank you. Well, our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, meeting with several Ukrainian refugees at a camp in Poland. Just one of the many stops the Secretary made today in Europe. Senior National Correspondent Rich Edson is traveling with the Secretary. He's live tonight in Moldova's capital city. Rich. Good evening, John. And the Secretary of State just arrived here in Moldova's capital. What we've had, though, is a full day in Poland along the Ukrainian border. It's past midnight here, but he spent most of the day along that corridor there. Had a meeting with the Ukrainian foreign minister right at the border. There, that's Dmitry Kuleba. Uh, it's right across between the two countries. They walked on both sides of the border there, show of solidarity for the two. Blinken and Kuleba discussed the effort against the Russian attack in a makeshift tent along the road between the two countries, while hundreds of refugees from Ukraine passed carrying suitcases, small children, and pets, some using canes and wheelchairs. Kuleba says Ukraine will win this war despite the overwhelming force advantage of the Russian military. He he said the question is the price his people will have to pay, and he wants Western aid stepped up. Kuleba says he's grateful for the aid Ukraine has already received, though he's calling on NATO's rejection of a no-fly zone weakness. We are now in the phase where NATO is saying, no, we're, gonna not, we're not going to do that. The time will come. Kuleba also pushed for former Soviet-aligned states in NATO, like Poland, to provide the Ukrainian Air Force MiG fighter jets. It's under consideration, according to the White House, though thus far has been rejected because it'd be seen as a major provocation by Moscow. Secretary Blinken largely refused to get into the specifics of that on whether the U.S. would support those jets. We are, again, looking uh, at everything, and as I said before, the uh, support for Ukraine not only has been uh, unprecedented, not only is it going, uh, not only is it going to continue, uh, it's going to increase. There have been direct discussions between Ukraine and Russia. Kuleba says there's been no progress in those talks, and that even an agreement to establish evacuation corridors for civilians has largely failed. He says every war ends with diplomacy, but, quote, we're not going to these talks to accept Russian ultimatums. He says the Russians are destroying his country, though he says what will happen after this is that the people of Ukraine will roll up their sleeves and build an even more beautiful country. John? Rich Edson live in Moldova's capital city. Rich, thank you. Well, according to the New York Times, Russian customs agents detained WNBA star Brittany Griner in February. The two-time gold medalist in the Olympics was going through screening at, Russian air, at a Russian airport when security allegedly found vape cartridges containing cannabis oil in her luggage. Multiple reports say Griner has been in custody for about three weeks now. Christina Coleman has the latest on her story from Los Angeles. Christina. Hi, John. Yes, Russian authorities are holding this WNBA star in custody for allegedly having cannabis oil while Russia continues to bomb and attack Ukraine. The Phoenix Mercury star is one of a number of WNBA who competes in Russia during the league's offseason. Today, in Griner's hometown of Houston, Texas Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee demanded Russia release her from custody. And anyone that is killing and attacking and destroying Ukraine, their neighboring country that does not bother them, has no right to hold Ms. Griner, period. Uh, if there is uh, challenges and concerns about her actions, uh, it should be helped, dealt with diplomatically, and she should be released. 
Russia's Customs Service released an edited video that appears to show Griner at an airport and a person removing a package out of her bag. The video has subtitles which say a criminal case was opened against the U.S. citizen. Russian officials say during the February airport screening, they found vape cartridges containing cannabis oil in her bag. If they determine Griner is guilty of transporting drugs, the 31-year-old could face up to 10 years in prison in Russia. Here's Fox News contributor Jim Gray. So here's an American, a high-profile American, uh, who is a great basketball player, uh, won two gold medals, uh, certainly, rep certainly represents the United States of America. Now he finds herself uh, in peril uh, based on the fact that she's in, she's in Russia uh, and Russia's at war uh, and America is sanctioning Russia. Today, the U.S. State Department updated its travel advisory, saying U.S. citizens should leave Russia immediately over safety concerns, including the potential for harassment against Americans by Russian government and security officials. They better be very careful about how they treat any of our citizens over there, because we have their citizens here. And so it's a concern, and we're going to watch it very closely and hold them accountable. Also, State Department officials are aware of Griner's situation. They say they're ready to provide all appropriate services. John? Christina Coleman. Christina, thank you. Our coverage continues in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We'll go back to our reporters on the ground in Ukraine next. Welcome to Sling TV's Fan Freakout Zone. Why do dermatologists world a block by Tri Valley's Paige Jewett, which leads to Lauren Grindy, who is money on the half court shot. The Mustangs built a seven point lead early, but would fall to West Central 68 to 39. The runner up play of the week goes to Augustana's Adam Dykeman, who catches the lob from Dylan LeBrun and then finishes with the alley oop slam. That play would help lead Augustana past SMSU. The top play of the week features a unique alley-oop. White River's Nicholas Marshall goes through his legs and lobs to Joe Seiler for the slam. White River would cruise past Jones County 86 to 61. That's a look at the Kelloland.com top five plays of the week. If you have a play you'd like to see on Kelloland, you can tweet to us using the hashtag Kellosports. In Sioux Falls, Grant Sweeter, Kelloland Sports. All right, well, we'll take a look ahead to Sunday's Summit League schedule. When we More people than we have been seeing in the past few days, and we understand that is because there have been new rules that have been lifted at the border. Those rules were that you had to be about six kilometers from the border. You could not just drive up and drop people off right at the border. Well, that's been relaxed. So now you are seeing even more people, believe it or not, uh, since the first few days when we got here. Um, but what you're seeing here is extraordinary, truly. I mean, people have come from all over the place. There are organizations, but they are just regular Polish citizens. There are citizens from other countries here as well in Europe who are just here because they saw the need for help. Now, if I can have Jerry just turn to my right, another bus has uh, just, I think, picked people up um, there. And so you'll see, you know, children sleeping on the bus. And these buses are taking people into further into Poland, but they're also taking people sometimes into places like Germany. We've noticed a lot of Germans here offering their homes for people to sleep in and offering a ride as well. And to my right, you are seeing a, a particular place for mothers and children. They have diapers inside. They have SIM cards that are specifically uh, for the women and children who have come here uh, over the border. And can I just mention one more thing? I mean, it's going to be quiet for just a second. There are a lot of kids here. I have heard only one child cry this whole time. There are children who are infants. There are children who are two and three and four and all the way up to teenage years. And it is so interesting to me and, and, and almost unbelievable that in this terrible cold, away from their homes, in uncertainty with their parents.
Yeah, we just lost Sarah's IFB, uh, or Sarah's sound, so I'm sorry, that's why I was uh, knocking my, my IFB, I thought I, it was my problem. Uh, so, uh, what Sarah was saying about the, the, that you don't hear kids crying and stuff a lot, which, uh, you know, some trauma experts will, will, you know, will point out that that, is off, that can be a sign of kids who have been through traumatic experiences and difficult experiences. Uh, you actually see a reduction sometimes in uh, in that kind of a response, which is obviously a, a worrying thing. But I mean, these kids have been through just to get to that border, that point on the Polish side where Sarah is. It has been, uh, you know, for many of them, it has taken days and days uh, of extreme. Amazon Fire device. Catch a code of news now at not on Fox Sioux Falls. It's news when you want it. Tonight, the prospects of peace in Ukraine shattered once again. A temporary ceasefire to evacuate two cities broken. Russia wrapping up its attacks across the country as Ukraine takes down some of its aircraft. Putin's warning, the Russian president comparing sanctions to a declaration of war, while Ukraine's president calls on his countrymen to go on the offensive and appeals directly to the U.S. Congress. Defiance, the brave Ukrainians protesting in the streets in a city now controlled by Russia, even marching towards soldiers as they fire. Children fleeing for their lives, more than half a million and counting, were there for the emotional reunions. Late today, Visa and MasterCard shutting down their services inside Russia. Americans joining the fight. Volunteers in the U.S. preparing to travel to Ukraine and battle Russia. Was there a moment that you decided you're going to go and try to fight in Ukraine? The moment I found out you could. Soaring prices at the gas pump, set to hit a new record within days. Would you be willing to pay even more to punish Russia? I would 100 percent. Uh, I'll be willing to pay a little bit extra. And more than just a flower, the symbol of hope uniting much of the world behind Ukraine. This is NBC Nightly News with Jose diaz Ballard. Good evening. The day started with the prospect of a limited ceasefire in Ukraine, but is ending with the war and the rhetoric only escalating. President Vladimir Putin today ratcheted up his warnings to NATO and the U.S., saying if anyone creates a no-fly zone over Ukraine, they will be considered part of this conflict. Home heating to food more expensive. How high the cost could climb. Also breaking tonight, the WNBA All-Star arrested in Russia at an airport near Moscow. Tonight, reaction from the State Department. Millions on alert as a storm system sweeps east, expected to bring heavy rain and strong winds. Reports just coming in at this hour of a massive tornado touching down. Rob Roughly 1.4 million Ukrainians, now refugees outside their country. The largest humanitarian crisis in Europe since World War II. Chris Livsay is in the city of Lviv in western Ukraine. He leads us off tonight with the very latest. Russia thought the invasion would be over swiftly. That was before their jets were plotting from Ukrainian skies to the cheering of locals. This downed pilot was asked his rank and unit details by his captors. In the face of impossible odds, Ukraine's resolve has shocked the world and frustrated the Russians into using banned weapons like cluster bombs, NATO says. Russia claims they're not hitting civilians, releasing videos of missiles launching at precision targets. But on-the-ground evidence tells a different story. This is a nightmare. How is this possible, this woman cries in the northern city of Chernikiv. Just look at this. Even nuclear power plants aren't safe. U.S. officials said the world narrowly avoided a catastrophe during Russia's siege of Europe's biggest nuclear facility. It could have been 10 times worse than the Chernobyl disaster, according to Ukraine. In this video, an operator can be heard demanding the Russians stop attacking. You are endangering the security of the whole world, he repeats. All of it sparking Europe's worst humanitarian crisis this century. More than one million refugees have fled the country, and the U.N. fears more than four million people, about 10 percent of the Ukrainian population, could be displaced in the coming weeks. Dozens come to this shelter here in the western city of Lviv before leaving the country. 
That's four-year-old Andre, exhausted after 20 hours of sleepless escape. His father stayed behind in the captured city of Kharkiv. Now he only has his mom and big brother. Every day begins with a text to our relatives. We ask, are you alive? Chris Livsay joins us from Lviv. Chris, more than a million Ukrainians have already fled the country. Can you put that into perspective for us? Well, it is an astounding number, one that's already on par with the people who were displaced from Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan in 2015. And it's going to get a lot worse, according to the UN. They fear that as many as four million people could be displaced in the coming months. We're only in, uh, we're only a week into this thing so far. And Chris, you know, as Russia appears to be gaining momentum, how are Ukrainians that you're talking to on the ground feeling? They have remarkably high spirits. They think they're going to win this David and Goliath conflict, despite being outsized and outgunned in every way by the Russians. One person I interviewed yesterday said, we have more faith in our military than the Pope has in God. Chris Livesay in Lviv, thank you. Today, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Poland. Blinken and is now under its control. But the people there risked their lives today to take to the streets. Aaron McLaughlin has more from inside Ukraine. In Kherson, Ukraine, defiance. Residents woke up under Russian occupation and took to the streets. Go home. There's no vodka here, this man says. Remember, Kherson is Ukraine. They first gathered by the hundreds and as word spread, thousands. Lashing out against the Russian occupiers. Then gunshots. Russian troops firing into the air. This woman, draped in her country's colors, stands firm. We are not afraid. We are together, she says. Similar scenes in the nearby town of Melitopol, also now occupied by Russian forces. Out of angry people bearing down on armed Russian troops. Earlier this week in Kherson, the Russian military invaded this port city, soon overwhelming Ukrainian forces. From the outset, the people resisted, covertly filming from their windows, even going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Russian soldier. You are occupiers, you are fascists, she says. The city's new rules posted on the mayor's Facebook, including a strict curfew, a maximum of two people allowed on the streets together at any time. We are not following the Russian instructions uh, properly. We are a free people, even under an invasion. Fearing Russian reprisal, this Kherson resident only wants to be known as Jimmy. Protecting the building. He says he's dedicated to documenting the occupation, covertly filming what's happening in the streets. You're the first city to fall to Russian forces in Ukraine. What example are you setting? We have no other way to escape the situation. We can't uh, evacuate. We are fighting from within, with our bare hands, with no weapon, with uh, phones in our hands, and with our flags. In Kherson and elsewhere, Russian firepower being confronted by the Ukrainian spirit. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Lviv, Ukraine. As the Russian onslaught intensifies, more Ukrainians are fleeing for their lives. This week, we've shown you their desperate race to get out of places like Kyiv. Well, many are now arriving across the border in Poland. An overwhelming number of them are children. Kelly Kobieja is there. Tonight, thousands more children are far from home, fleeing by train, bus, on foot. Some too young to understand, leaving fathers and grandfathers behind. More than 600,000 children already displaced by war. Oksana's 14-year-old son was living with family in Ukraine while she worked in Poland. The family now reunited. It was really bad there, her son says. Everyone wants to get their child out if they can, Oksana tells me. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited the Polish-Ukrainian border today, meeting with refugees at an abandoned shopping mall now turned refugee center. The number of mothers and children in shelters now skyrocketing. I'm really grateful to be in Poland, Ludmilla tells me, because my children can be children a little while longer. Across Ukraine's border, a vast volunteer army is providing food and comfort, handing out toys in Poland. Throwing a surprise birthday party for a six-year-old refugee in Romania. And helping more than 100 orphans flee Ukraine through Moldova. All of them now safe in Germany. 
Refugees often exhausted and traumatized by what they left behind. Yeah. I heard pistols firing and explosions, 11-year-old Christina told me. I was really scared, and in the morning, my mom said, please pack, we have to leave. In Ukraine, the first shipment of aid from UNICEF finally getting through. Medical supplies and first aid kits with 17,000 blankets on the way. On the border, there's no end to the flow of refugees. Already more than 1.4 million escaping the war zone. And for many here, it's hard to think about the future. So what will you do long term? Uh, I don't know. I, I just uh, wanted to, uh, to escape, to, to help my kids. Uh, that's why. And uh, now I don't know. I feel uh, in my kids are uh, in safe. Anastasia and her two-year-old son, Sergei, fled Odessa, the city now braced for a Russian attack. For the war to stop, she tells me, so we can go home. And Kelly joins us across the border in Poland, where volunteers, Kelly, have been working around the clock to help refugees coming in. That's right, Jose, but some of those volunteer groups now say they are overwhelmed and they need more government help. Jose? Kelly Kobie. And where these families will go. With children eager to learn, Maxim even arranging a volunteer to Polish. Starting, of course, with the names of animals. North of here in Lublin, Poland, this woman, Oksana, is terrified. Her husband and her daughter's fiance still in Ukraine, but telling our Phil Lipoff she is eternally grateful to Poland for providing her and her two children safety. To the Polish people, I want to say thank you very much for the man who helps to Ukrainian women, to Ukrainian children, to, Ukraine, to all Ukrainian people. The trauma of the last two weeks bringing Oksana to her knees. In Ukraine, so many still trying to... Long lines at the Lviv train station stretching for as far as the eye can see. Anxious families desperate to get out. But there's another image there too. A teacher named Olga playing the piano telling ABC she hopes her music can quote, make people a bit happy. This is the way I can help Ukrainians to boost their mood, to show that uh, there is a hope in the middle of the darkness. So many trying to offer support and comfort. Marcus Moore back with us now from one of those busy train stations there in Poland. And Marcus, you're learning world leaders are ramping up efforts to help those refugees. Oh, we are, with, and, and we've also seen the relief effort here evolve. It's become more organized, and shelters have been set up. And the, the president here in Poland said he has pledged to streamline the entry process into the country uh, for those refugees. And world leaders are arriving here. Secretary Blinken's visit, the first among them, and more U.S. officials are expected to travel to the region here in the coming week. With All right, Marcus, thank you. And Ukrainian President Zelensky making that impassioned plea to the U.S. today, calling for tougher measures measures against Putin, including push to ban oil imports from Russia. Let's bring in ABC's White House correspondent, Mary Alice Parks. And Mary Alice, the Biden administration responding, they're not ready to take that step. With that's right, part of the hesitation here is Europe and protecting allies. The U.S. and Europe have been working closely, trying to respond together to Russia. But so many European nations have long been dependent on Russian oil. So a full ban there is hard to imagine. Now, in the U.S., we only export about 1% of Russia's oil. Still, experts say that even a ban on that much could impact gas prices, and that is something the White House is really trying to avoid, too. Tonight, we are seeing more major companies essentially stepping in and boycotting Russia. Like you said, both Visa and MasterCard announcing that they are suspending operations in Russia. President Zelensky had been calling for that just hours before. We are also learning, like you mentioned, that the State Department is now asking for U.S. citizens to leave immediately or an increased risk of harassment by Russian officials. With Mary Alice Parks in Washington, thank you. The Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, this is playing hide and seek in the... Really, guys? He's having a hard time leaving. Then take him to the... We need to find a way around this. Peter Brooks, senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Peter, thanks. Good to be with you. Well, gas prices they up 30 cents a week ago. More lawmakers from both parties call for a ban on the import of Russian energy. 
We'll take it up with economist Peter Morisi next. The international to mention the possibility that Putin would use nuclear weapons if we I intervened. That's basically what's stopping us at this point. But I'm afraid there's going to be some incident in the next week or so like this, like a, a leak, a, a, an attack on a power plant that could mass uh, uh, casualty event, like b bombing of the, the, the apartment buildings that we're seeing that kills hundreds of Ukrainians, like a particularly impassioned plea that's going to just tip the emotional balance for Americans and Europeans, going to basically force us to roll the nuclear dice and intervene in a conflict that could then escalate to even greater levels. Brett, I, I want your thoughts because we've talked a lot about a no-fly zone. We're talking about that because that is what President Zelensky has been asking for. We've also talked about President Zelensky's request for fighter jets um, from, from NATO countries. You just ticked through a, a quick but long list of other ways in which you think the U.S. NATO countries can be involved diplomatically. Walk us through them again. Yeah, look, I mean, clearly there is reluctance here in Washington and in European capitals for us to directly get engaged capabilities, capabilities that we can pass on to the Ukrainians to at least help to slow, if not stop, some of those bombardments. I think we also need to look at ways that we can put additional pressure on Putin at home. Clearly, there is discontent. There is division in Russian society. We have to ensure that Russians are seeing what's happening in Ukraine. And that's why I've called for an information invasion of Russia. Uh, clearly, Russia has already invaded the United States from an information standpoint. I think we should return the favor and we should ensure that Russians can see exactly what Putin is doing in Ukraine, because that will serve to undermine uh, some of the puffed up uh, propaganda he has laid out on Russian airwaves. More important now after he shut off uh, what was uh, the remaining elements of independent media. An information invasion harder now than ever. Brett Bruin, Joe Cerencioni, thank you both so much for talking us through this. Next, a big crackdown on Russia's disinformation machine. What we're just talking about is doing to shut off Russia's other house of falsehoods. NBC and Colin with us after the break. Plus, we are following that breaking news. Moments ago, Visa and MasterCard said they're suspending all operations in Russia. It's a move that could hit Russians hard as the country sits on the brink of economic isolation. More at the top of the hour. And today, in Times Square, a protest in support of Ukraine, New York, just one of the many cities around the world demonstrating against the war. We're watching American Voices only on MSNBC. For skin that works as hard as you do. Don't settle for silver. Seven intense moisturizers to help stop dry skin before it starts. Gold Bond Healing Lotion. Championing your skin. We hit the button every weekend. Jingles doesn't care. It's part of the civilian there. Just part of the clear evidence we see all the time that Russia's promise it's not targeting civilians is essentially nonsense. And here in Odessa, the broad, widening fear that all this activity military along the Black Sea coast by Russia is essentially going to lead to pressure in Odessa, which results in some sort of broad military move against this, the third largest city in Ukraine and the most important port that it has. Nick Wall, appreciate that. We are joined right now by a uh, by. Uh, Kira Rudik, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, joining us from, from Kyiv. Uh, uh, Mr. Rudik, I appreciate you joining us. What, what is the situation that you are seeing on the ground today in Kyiv? Hello, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, so the situation um, have not changed much in Kyiv. We, as uh, usually, getting ready for a siege. And there was a um, pretty moderate shelling this night. So right now, um, I don't have to go to the bomb shelter, which is a rare case for this time. Um, we do prepare to uh, have uh, Russian forces come here like within the next three to five days. There has been 
uh, attempt to attack uh, the entrance and exit to the city. However, it didn't work very well for Russians. So that's why uh, I would say the situation is still the same and we are getting more and more time to be ready to get ready to any kind of um, of the events so either that would be a siege or it will be a direct attack or it would be some shelling though for the shelling i'm sure that you know that there is no way for us to prepare we just need to uh, work uh, all the possible solutions with our nato partners that they would help us and protect uh, the city from the sky and uh, right now we see that uh, not happening and that's why we need to push harder and we need to ask for it yeah i mean obviously you know president zelensky every uh, ukrainian official I've talked to has been pushing for a, a no-fly zone which as of now is is clearly from the u.s standpoint uh, u.s officials in and most eu officials that is seems to be a, off the table that they are not willing to consider at this point um without a no-fly zone without uh, the ability to stop Russia from using missiles, uh, artillery shells, uh, firing into civilian areas. How long? Uh, I mean, how, the inability to control the skies. How 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 hard is that for Ukraine to defend against? How how, how dangerous is that for Ukraine? You wanted to ask how much long we are going to stand? Well, we will stand to... No, I... Uh, uh, I, I, I yeah. yeah, well, we, we will. Yeah. Uh, you know, the no-fly zone would give us a chance to win this war. Because you see how good we are doing on the ground. And we are doing good uh, with our civilians going out on the streets and saying, Russians, go home. We are doing very good with our soldiers who are fighting as uh, as real heroes and we are doing great with our resistance teams who are helping to bite russian army here and there here and there so uh, no matter that at the very beginning of this war everybody whom i talked to said you guys are not standing a chance you have maybe 24 48 hours to lose all your cities as of right now we are still standing and but the no-fly zone will allow us to actually win and without it, we are just helpless with the attacks that are coming from the sky. We are have helpless. Uh, Ukrainian Parliament member Kira Rudik, I, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. The breaking news continues next. There are growing calls tonight for Vladimir Putin to be prosecuted for war crimes as Russian forces use increasingly brutal tactics in Ukraine. Breeze car. Can get with their cousins. Type 2 diabetes. Race made its ceremonial start in Anchorage, Alaska. 49 dog teams, led by drivers called mushers, are attempting the 1,000 mile race across the state. The record to beat eight days, three hours, 40 minutes, and 13 seconds. Good luck. Tonight, Mike Krzyzewski is set to coach his final home college basketball game as Duke takes on rival North Carolina. Students have been waiting and sleeping outside the stadium all week, hoping to get a free ticket to the game. The few tickets available for resale are in the Super Bowl range. The average cost $3,600 each. Next on the CBS Weekend News, a vacation to visit family turns into a harrowing escape from war. that oil will stay at or, or above $100 a barrel, and that's going to end up being felt in the form of higher ticket prices. The Gaston family opting to drive from New York to Panama City Beach, Florida. That was almost, what, 3000 Yeah, 3000 just to fly and rent a car. Right. But experts say there are still deals to snag this spring break, with many Americans flying to Europe and trips now nervous because of war if demand stays soft i think you could really see airlines starting to slash the price in order to sell many of those flights for this spring and summer but no matter where you go the time to act is now if you wait are you going to get a better deal <laughs> no not now.
about Osteto. She said Osteto helps reduce TD movements in adults. Gasoline. Uh, if you raise the price of gasoline from $3 a gallon to $5 a gallon, which is happening, uh, you don't conserve very much. It's a very foolish thing to do. You have to understand that some of the climate change folks, for example, in the House of Representatives who criticize President Biden for not saying he was going to do more to curtail oil production at a time like this in a state of the union. It's a religion. And unfortunately, they're worshiping false gods. We have we about all want to cut back. We all want to cut back what we use. But capping American production isn't the way to do it. We have about 30 seconds left, Peter. Visa and MasterCard, we just learned at the beginning of this hour, have announced they will no longer conduct operations in Russia. What does that mean? do? Um, does it uh, simply inconvenience consumers there? What's the effect? Oh, it does inconvenience consumers there. It makes it very difficult for business to business transactions, and it makes it difficult for, for, for ordinary people to get around. When Apple Pay shut down uh, a few days ago, Russians were stuck in the subway because they couldn't get fare cards, the people that rely on, on, on their iPhones. These are useful things to do. You know, going into this, this adventure, this, this terrible, terrible adventure. Uh, the Russians had a domestic support. So, you know, we shouldn't be, we, we should not be that kind to the Russian people at a time like this. If they want this to stop, they know where Vladimir lives and they should remove him. University of Maryland economist, uh, e economist and economics professor, Peter Morisi. Thank you. Take care. Well, amidst the horrors of war, a moment of humanity at the Lviv train station. Recognize that tune? A young woman playing Wonderful World the, uh, on the piano today as Ukrainians try to flee their home country. Thousands of women and children arrived in the western Ukraine city as the state railway added more trains to rescue people from fierce Russian attacks on eastern cities. I'm John Scott. Our coverage continues with an expanded edition of the Fox Report. Top of the hour, straight ahead. Spending a second or two in a situation where you hear a bomb, that's going to change everything. You can be watching videos and pictures and reading the articles, but these are actual individuals going through this. I've been just running on pure adrenaline for the past uh, four, well, I don't even know how many days it is now, four. Toy is a 31-year-old social media manager living in Chicago. All right, guys, this is a bomb shelter. She was visiting her mother in Kyiv when Russia invaded Ukraine. They went underground, spending a day in a bomb shelter before fleeing to Poland. Nobody was complaining. Even children weren't crying. The journey took three buses and two days. So this is a place where they're giving out food and provision, I guess. I'm not going to lie. I'm not feeling proud right now of myself because... It's, it's kind of feels like running away. And I will do my best to help everybody else who is in Ukraine because my family, my whole family is still there. Her father sent her this video from Kherson, the city where she grew up. After the city fell to Russian troops, we spoke to Olga again. People are scared to leave their houses. Um, there are troops checking and stopping people and everything. Now a longer journey is ahead. I'm trying to get my mom to Chicago, honestly. I, I can't leave her. Like, her, we packed a suitcase, like a little carry-on, and that's literally all her life there. She's worried about her father, but says her family and her people are resilient. Olga, where do you get your strengths? If I were to name the strength, like, I think it's my in my DNA. This is in our blood. I'm not allowed to not be strong because my entire country is strong. We're thinking of Olga and her family. That is the news for this Saturday. Tomorrow, Jerika Duncan anchors the broadcast. I'm Adriana Diaz in Chicago. Good night.
A wintry mess will still be on our hands for a little while longer, so please exercise caution if you absolutely must be out through the rest of the evening and into the night for that matter. Snow gradually tapers off. Overnight low temperatures fall into the teens and 20s, so any standing order we may have had earlier, well, that's going to freeze over in a hurry. Then we have a more uniform spread of temperature for Sunday. 20s to low 30s, but it's also quieter. We'll talk about the rest of your seven-day forecast coming up, but until then, Kelloland Weekend News starts right now. Live from Kelloland Media Group, Kelloland Weekend News. The Summit League Basketball Championships are back. We're going to bring you a live report momentarily. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dan Centella. A car crash in Central Sioux Falls today put the car inside a popular business. Kelloland's Renee Ortiz was at the scene earlier today and she joins us now. Good evening, Renee. Good evening, Dan. Sergeant Travis Olson with the Sioux Falls Police Department tells us that the crash resulted in injuries to nine different people, but the injuries are believed to be non-life-threatening. The driver, passenger, and seven other people inside the store were hurt. This afternoon, I spoke to someone who was there at the scene. I pulled over, uh, just literally right outside the hole along the curb. I looked in and I saw the taillights of, the, of a car the building so then I immediately knew it was a car that went through the side of the wall mm -hmm. and then that's when I ran to the front door to see if I could be of assistance to somebody that was inside. Tonight on Kelloland Weekend News at 10 we'll bring you more from him and his response to this crash. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Renee. And weather, Adams had a relatively busy day with wintry weather, and he's zeroing on, on something called the temperature outline, Adam? Yeah, temperature profile up aloft. That's close. been close. 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 You nah. know what? I'll give you time. I'll give you, I'll give you credit for that one. Well, partial credit, uh, considering, you know, it's kind of an interesting topic, at least, to me at least. It basically dictates whether we get snow, rain, sleet, freezing rain, or some combination of the four. We're the declaration of war now. Everybody wants to be independent, to be free. I pray every day, I pray every night. Ukraine will win this war anyway, because this is the people's war for their land, and we defend the right cause. I'm Pamela Brown in Washington. You were in the CNN newsroom on this Saturday. Russian President Vladimir Putin issuing a chilling warning to the West. The international sanctions against him and his country are, quote, the equivalent of a declaration of war. Putin made that announcement while at Aeroflot, Russia's largest airline owned primarily by the government, crippled by airspace closures from the West. Now compare this cheery image with the horrors unfolding in Ukraine. We need to warn you that these images are disturbing. Inside this blood-stained blanket is a little boy, 18 months old, barely a toddler, Tragically, the hospital workers couldn't save him. He was wounded by shelling. Russia declaring a ceasefire in his town, Mariupol. City officials there say Russian forces are targeting civilians. The Russian army start to bomb that places where people connected a uh, half an hour ago. So the targets of the artillery was to make, uh, to kill as much uh, citizens of Mariupol as possible. Ukraine is fighting back. This video from its armed services supposedly shows a Russian helicopter being shot down north of the capital. CNN is unable to verify when this happened. North on Minnesota when it left the road and crashed into the south side of the building. We spoke to a witness who saw what seemed to be some sort of crash involving two vehicles immediately before one of them ran into the building. And it looked like these two cars coming down Minnesota right here. One was going uh, pretty, pretty fast, faster than the other. And it looked like the front of one car, the other, and then they both went out of control. But instead of going down this street, one went straight into the side of the Starbucks and the other just kept going down that road. Now, just within the last couple hours here, police say it appears that the 65-year-old man driving the SUV had some sort of a medical event that led to the crash, and neither drugs nor alcohol were involved. He and his female passenger were hospitalized with serious injuries, but are expected to be okay. In addition, seven people inside the building, including one Starbucks employee and one juvenile, were hospitalized with non-life-threatening injuries. 
Several nearby streets, including parts of Minnesota Avenue, were closed for several hours while police investigated. The latest on the U crisis in Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin warning that Ukrainian statehood is in jeopardy, pinning the blame on the country's leaders. Putin also pushed back against Western sanctions, saying that they are akin to declaring war and also warned against other nations imposing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. This came after talks for a ceasefire to evacuate refugees collapsed. Meantime, Russian leaders are asserting that Russia has lost more than 10,000 troops during the invasion. Microsoft is joining the, gro the growing list of major companies halt business in Russia. The company says it has suspended all new sales in Russia. Other companies like Apple, Disney, and Ford have decided to halt business in Russia due to the Ukraine invasion, further hurting their economy amid harsh sanctions. SDSU, SDSU and USD are returning to the Premier Center for the Summit League tournament today, and so did their fans. The tourney kicked off today, and after a year of empty stands due to the pandemic, fans of both schools were back to cheer on their teams. That included the Somson, a pair of SDSU super fans from Pier, who went to every Summit League tournament in Sioux Falls until last year. You got to have the atmosphere, and uh, we missed out on that. And, you know, that COVID thing put a hammer on a lot of, a lot of the excitement. Now it's back. And you're probably wondering about that sombrero. Mr. Somson got that unique sombrero. Uh, when he picked it up at a tourist shop in northern Mexico, that was for some reason shocked with SDSU attire. Now, as for the games themselves, South Dakota schools are faring well so far. Zach will have a full breakdown ahead in sports. Most college students traveling to Sioux Falls today are just hoping to see their teams win, but the Sioux Falls Development Center is hoping those students will become part of Sioux Falls in the near future. Sarah Parkin has our story live from the Denny. Sarah. While the players are shooting for a win here at the Summit League Tournament today, the Sioux Falls Development Foundation is hoping to score a basket with the college students in attendance for the Sioux Falls workforce. Before his age and the ways in which COVID has made his age more apparent to him, more front of mind. Melinda, here is Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken today discussing aid to Ukraine for the con consequences for Russia. Take a listen. We've come from several days of meetings with uh, NATO, the European. The power plant came into attack two nights ago. It's mostly women and children come here to Lviv because military-aged males have to stay and fight. That's part of President Zelensky's decree. The refugees coming here fleeing a war-torn Ukraine, cities destroyed by the Russians, such as Kharkiv and Mariupol, as trade just described, and the capital. Some here think they have to stay with the relatives because they can't make it to the border, John. Others using this place as a rest stop before fleeing the country, not just to Poland, but to Slovakia and Hungary as well. Now, earlier we visited this makeshift soup kitchen. The crew here has made enough stew for 5,000 people over the past few days. Many Ukrainians here donating food, these large kettles, and their time to prepare it. Now, this is one of the oldest Catholic churches here in Lviv. Pope John Paul II once visited here two decades ago and preached. In addition to preparing for Mass tonight, the cathedral is also preparing for potential airstrikes by Russian jets, boarding up stained glass windows, and also ancient relics inside. It is the, the heart of our church, so it's very important to, to prepare this building and ourselves to. It's not just Ukrainians fleeing their country, there's hundreds of thousands of Russians as well. This is an exercise. You can go on the computer, try to book a train from Moscow to Tallinn or to Helsinki. You won't find any trains available for the next two weeks. John? Lucas Tomlinson in Lviv. You we will overcome everything, she says. For the people of Irpin, the journey is just beginning. They're loaded onto buses to the train station. From there, they don't know where they will go. Clarissa Ward, CNN, Irpin. Our thank you to Clarissa for bringing these important stories to the forefront. We'll take a look here. Uh, that is a Russian fighter jet tumbling out of the sky and plunging to Earth. This video posted on social media apparently captures the moment that Ukrainian forces brought down the aircraft. A stunning David versus Goliath moment. CNN has geolocated and verified the authenticity of the video. 
And joining me now, retired Army Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, a CNN military analyst who was the commanding general for Europe and the 7th Army. Hi, General. So the reports from inside Ukraine is that Russia is showing little interest in sparing civilians, and you're seeing that in the video, right? You say it is very clear that war crimes are being committed. How so? Well, we can see the type of weapons they're using, cluster munitions, thermobaric bombs. Uh, they have already used those. We've seen evidence of that. I've, I've seen the cluster munitions falling on some of the films from within Ukraine. But they're also focusing, Pamela, uh, exclusively on the civilian population. When you look at what the International Commission of the, uh, Committee of the Red Cross has said uh, institutes a war crime, they, the Russian forces have violated about eight different categories. They have attacked civilians. They have attack, attacked civilian infrastructure like hospitals and schools and neighborhoods. They have used uh, weapons that are not supposed to be used in warfare. And they have uh, done things like uh, capture prisoners from the civilian uh, population and use those as shields or as uh, uh, hostages. So those and many other things tell me that they are executing a campaign of scorched earth to try and intimidate uh, Ukraine's population, much like they've done in the past. We have seen multiple times in places like Syria uh, and, and in their own republics like Chechnya. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we've seen brutally and just the disregard for human life. You had mentioned the thermobaric bombs. We had talked about that last weekend when the CNN crew saw them going in um, to Ukraine. But do we know if those have actually been used for the vacuum bombs that suck in all the oxygen in the atmosphere? Do we know that they have been used? I just want to be clear on that. No, it's a good point. And no, we do not know for okay. sure if they have been used. There are indicators that they have based on explosive types and, and films, but they can't pinpoint to those bombs. And in fact, one, one of the weapon systems has actually been captured by Ukraine's forces. Uh, so that's also a good sign. But, but no, you're absolutely right. There are indicators that they have employed those, but certainly uh, we don't have factual proof of that. Okay. As we mentioned earlier today, Ukrainian President Zelensky again called for U.S. assistance in establishing a no-fly zone in Ukraine, as well as more military support. Republican Ben Sass was among the bipartisan group of senators taking part in that Zoom call. And here is his response to that request. He said, Ukraine needs air power urgently and America could send it. Zelensky's message is simple. Close the skies or give us planes. Let's be clear-eyed about our options. A no-fly zone means sending American pilots into combat against Russian jets and air defenses in a battle between nuclear powers that could spiral out of control quickly. So he goes on to suggest that sending Ukrainians planes, helicopters, and UAVs to Kyiv instead. What do you think of that? Uh, instead of enforcing a no-fly zone, sending uh, UAVs, helicopters, planes, so that the Ukrainians could potentially enforce one of their own? Well, as President Zelensky has said, send us the type of equipment that we have used in the past that our military has used, which was when they were part of the Warsaw Pact. So they have probably a lot of pilots who can fly uh, the Russian-type air, aircraft like the SUs and the MiGs. Uh, so that would be acceptable. And, and boy, wouldn't it be ironic, Pamela, if suddenly the NATO countries were providing lend-lease equipment, much like the United States did to the Soviet Union during World War II to get them out of the grasp, grasp of the, the Nazis. It would be a very ironic thing, but it would also be very challenging because I think Mr. Putin would contest that. He would see that as a, an attempt by NATO to reinforce Ukraine, uh, perhaps in a non-kinetic way. So even that's a little bit dangerous, but I would certainly be one that would suggest that that's a whole lot better than than the, uh, the what I would consider a ludicrous, ludicrous approach of establishing a no-fly zone. All right, General, stay right there because we have some breaking news from the White House. I'm going to go to Arlette Signs. Arlette? Well, Pamela, we learned just moments ago that President Biden spoke with Ukrainian President Zelensky. Within the past hour, the two men spent about...